Amen, amen. You guys could be seated. I am so, so glad that you guys could be with us tonight. How many of you guys have had, let me just ask this hypothetical question. How many of you guys have had a pretty long week this week? <laughs> Isn't it crazy? I feel like there is, I feel like there is constantly something, something to try and wear us down. Maybe it doesn't do it by itself organically, but I don't know. It feels like everything on social media nowadays just has like a weight to it. Like every time you scroll on Twitter or on Instagram, a five pound weight is added to your chest. It's added to your spirit. It's added to your conscience. Can we just for at least for the hour that I have you guys for, can we just try to at least forget about that? Matter of fact, can we just give it to Jesus tonight? A lot of people, and the Bible is very clear about this when it says it, it says that his weight is lighter than any of the weight that we put on ourselves. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to see what, what that means. What does that entail? Because I don't know about you, but I've had a long week as well, and I am ready for God to just take it all away. Could you tell the person next to you, it is time for God to take it all away. Tell the other person, the one you didn't prefer, I love you. And I'm sorry that I chose you second. <laughs> Amen. Amen. For those of you guys who don't know us, this is SYA. We are the young adult ministry uh, beneath our church, Segadores de Vida. This is our church, Segadores. We are so, so thankful to be here, and we honor our bishop, Rudy Gracia, who has allowed us, amen, who has allowed us to continue having services month after month, and we are so thankful for him. I know he's watching us, so I got to do always a little quick shout out. Um, but in any case, we are so glad that you could be here with us. My name is Rico Cruz. Myself and my wife, Vanessa, we lead SYA. And um, amen, amen, amen. And uh, we have done some pretty crazy things this year. Uh, we have thrown a conference. We have opened our church. We have done a lot of things that, that um, and it's not to compare, it's not to brag, it's not any of that. Really, it's just to try and glorify Jesus even when some people say we shouldn't or when some people say we can't. Or it doesn't matter, honestly, the politics of it all and, and all that, I've had it up to here with it. Let's keep tonight about Jesus, yeah? Let's keep tonight about what he can do because he can do a lot. How many guys know that no matter what happens, no matter who wins the presidency, no matter this, no matter that, no matter how you got here or when you got here or what you want to do now that you are here, God still is on the throne. God still remains king. He has always been in control. He has always, always, and will always have the last say. Amen? Amen. I know that there are a lot of people who kind of come to church sometimes and they they express this to me and, uh, and write to me on social media or even here publicly. They express to me that sometimes they go to church hoping that the church would be sort of like a political compass for them. And uh, that's, that's sort of a bit of, you know, kind of fair thinking. I could see why people do that. But really, I don't think the church should be a political compass. I think it really should be what God is doing in you. Amen. All of us have been transformed by Jesus. All of us have been uh, completely, or if you have, if you've been a part of our church, you know that God can restore and God can fix who you are. Amen. And we're not here to, to, to try and say, oh, this is right or that is right. We will always be in support of the church. We will always want to open our church. We think that it is any sort of opposition who tells us, do not open your church. We think that that, not, that might not be in God's plans. Amen. So we have, sort of, we have sort of seen a lot, and uh, people have told us a lot and expressed a lot. And to be honest, we're not really here to apologize for standing up for Jesus at all, at all in any way, shape, or form. We will never apologize for saying, no, no, maybe we should have closed our church. Never, never, ever, ever. I wholeheartedly believe that God is with us, that God is in this church. He will continue to be in this church. He's been in this church for 30 years since it was founded. And it will continue to be a beacon of hope and of light in this world. Amen? If you know us and you know our church, you know that it extends far beyond these four walls. Our church every single week supports and allows other ministries all around the globe to grow. Our church is a, and, and I mean this, our church is a pillar when it comes to the Latin American community because of our Bishop Rudy Gracia. And if there's any sort of opposition or you guys shouldn't do that because this, 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 and that... We're just not going to go along with that. Amen? 
all in good conscience, all in good hope. We're all good, we're all good right? Amen. Good vibes, good energy. Come on, let's keep it together. Nobody's mad at anybody. There's no resentment up on the stage. There's no sort of if that. No, no, no. That's okay. That's okay. Other people sometimes can sort of be opposed to that and not want us to do certain things. But we're just here to glorify God, point blank, period. doesn't matter. Amen? You guys with us? You guys with me? All right. Can you open up your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4? 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to look at a verse where um, the Apostle Paul is enlightening one of his disciples. And um, he's pretty much telling him a whole bunch of things about leadership, about the type of leader that is expected to be on this earth. And the thing about Paul the Apostle was that he really doesn't pull any punches. He tells you like it is. And how many of you guys are thankful for leaders that tell us things like they are? That they, that they don't hide behind any wall, that they don't hide behind any truth. They always say things according to how it should be. Amen? I believe that in this time, it's so important for us to not just be a church that is essential. And what I mean by that is a lot of times they want to classify the church as essential or non-essential. Or no, no, the church closes its doors, but not uh, the liquor store or not the strip club or not this or that. The church is essential. Amen? And beyond that, come on now, and beyond that, not only should the church be essential, but our leadership should be essential. What I mean by that is us as leaders, we should know what we want to do according to how God wants us to do things. You with me? Also, by the way, if you're new here and if you hear people shout or say amen, we highly encourage that. There is, a, there is no point. Amen. 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 Yes. There is no point, and I think a lot of us have been to churches, maybe in our youth, or maybe Catholic, or maybe Adventist, like myself, I was Seventh-day Adventist. I didn't know why I was a Seventh-day Adventist. My mom told me I was an Adventist. And um, if you remember what it was like in Seventh-day Adventist, we would sit down on a Saturday for four hours, and it would just be silence. And it would, as a, as a, as a young boy, it would agonize my soul. Um, my mom had to bring snacks or coloring books or this or that. But how many of you guys know, you guys with kids, coloring books only work for about, what, 20 minutes? <laughs> Services were four hours. Um, so uh, now that we are in a church where God has designed and designated us to be, there is no point in staying quiet about how good God is. Um, if you hear something, just feel free to shout amen. If you hear something you don't like, you don't have to say anything. But... Uh, but in any case, we're all good here. We're all friends here. So please feel free to uh, shout me down. In any case, let's, um, let's jump into 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And uh, tonight's message is called uh, Essential Leaders for a Time Such as This. Why? Because we are in very, very unique times. And like we shared, this is more than just about leadership, more than just about our church. It's about how we are, us as individuals. I believe that God prioritizes spiritual health. I believe that God prioritizes health, period. You can see it all along the Bible. He prioritizes how well you are. Amen? He sat down with the woman at the well. First of all, sitting down with a woman was nearly illegal at the time. Second of all, her being a Samaritan and him being a Jewish man, that was unheard of. Unheard of at the time. So yes, there were big cultural differences at the time in the Bible. So for him to sit down with a, uh, with a not Samaritan woman, it was, she was from, uh, wow, I'm blanking right now. And I was like, oh, I'm ready for this. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, so for her to, to sit down with, with him, it was a really, really big deal. But how many of you guys know that Jesus didn't really care about the laws in that particular sense? He was more concerned with her well-being. He was more concerned with how well she was doing in her life. So tonight's verse is, uh, we're going to start from verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I want you guys to stay with me. This is the ESV translation. And it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, though through insincerity of liars whose consciences have been seared. Now, who forbid marriage and require abstinence of foods for that God created to be received with thanksgiving. He's basically just adding a lot of context as to the time and how people in the end times are going to depart from Jesus. Now, verse 4 says, Everything created by God is good. 
And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Basically just giving us a little bit of context as to what's about to happen. Verse 6, and if you guys have this slide. If you, put these bef- if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed, having nothing to do with irreverent and silly myths. Rather, and I want you guys to stay with me on this. This is Paul telling Timothy what to do. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And all the people who don't like going to the gym said? Amen. 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 Now, verse 9. Stick with me. And it says, And the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Amen? Let's give, let's give God a big round of applause just for that verse. Amen. There is so much to unpack here. There is so much to take away from. And if you guys were in our last discipleship meeting, to all the guys that I've been meeting, meeting with every Monday, you know kind of where this message is going. Uh, by the way, yeah, we have had uh, guys' discipleship meetings every Monday night. If there's a guy here who was completely unaware, please talk to your leader and then talk to me because I want to know why that leader didn't tell you. Um, uh, in any case, you know kind of where this is going. Paul is basically encouraging Timothy, a younger disciple, one who was just starting off in his ministry, that there are a few things that are going to happen. One, when people decide to leave the faith, which we won't jump into that much. But two, things that happen within ourselves. First of all, it's a little bit unusual for him to kind of give him such blatant context as to what is happening at the time. He tells Timothy, "I I need you to train yourself. But beyond training yourself, I need you to train yourself when it comes to godliness. How many of us actually, practically, go to a gym here? I want to see if, if you guys uh, raise your hand. It's okay. It's okay. No shame in that game. Uh, I see, I see a, uh, very high hands and some kind of hands like this. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. No judgment. But there are a lot of people in this room. Now, since I've been meeting with the guys every Monday night, I kind of have it in my head that a lot of these guys either really, really are passionate about the gym that they, that they go to, or they're kind of passive about the gym that they go to. Now, either one will get you the desired results. We know that when it comes to intensity, when it comes to working out, when it comes to bulking up, or, or what are some of the gym words that you guys say? instantly, instantly, this guy. Yep, exactly. Yeah, said it loud and clear. Gains, all these guys, gains, gains, gains. They walk in, they walk into the, to the conference room back there. They might as well kick the door down. They're holding their, bottle, their water bottles, their protein shakes. I know it. I know it when I see it. Hey, where are you going? I know you're not going home. I know you're not about to go watch a romantic comedy and go to bed. Nope, you're going straight to the gym. <laughs> I know it. And um, it's evident. It's evident, but what Paul is really telling us in this verse is, I need you to keep the following things into context. The same way you train yourself physically, Paul is inviting Timothy to train himself spiritually. Amen? You guys with me? Now, this is a little bit of a novel concept because a lot of us have it in our heads that the minute we feel the most spiritual, One, is either in church, or two, it is the minute we give our lives to Jesus. Stay with me, guys. The minute we give our lives to Jesus, would you consider those to be the spiritual pinnacles of your life? If so, I would categorize myself right there with you. Because I remember, I remember somebody was doing an altar call on this stage at our old church. They were saying, Jesus knocks on the door of your heart. And for whatever reason, my heart was pounding. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus? Maybe I have low blood pressure. I don't know. But my heart, my heart was pounding. And I'm like, what is going on? This guy, everything he's saying is exactly what I've been going through. And I felt finally for the first time, I had been going to my church, uh, Seventh-day Adventist church since I was like five years old or six years old. And I never felt what I had been feeling that moment in church. And I felt like never before, like a tug pulling me towards the stage. And I said, uh, okay, and I'm going to go up, I'm going to go up, I gave my life to Christ, and uh, the rest is history. Nope, <laughs> the rest wasn't history, 
God finally was able to join me in a journey, or should I say I was able to join him in a journey that he had planned for me. Amen? Amazing, amazing, right? Amazing story. I would consider that a spiritual highlight. But how many of us continue to have spiritual highlights in our lives? How many of us are training ourselves in godliness the way Paul is describing? The reason why this is so important is because if we prioritize ourselves, and I'm not attacking anybody who raised their hands, but if we prioritize our physicality that much, we should also prioritize our spirituality. The reason why this is so important is because, one, we know that our bodies will change. We know that we have to work them out. We know that we like to at least be in good shape, at least be in good form. But two, we don't keep in mind that the same thing happens to our spirit. Your spirit, just like your body, will be worn down. Your spirit, just like your body, will get tired one day. What's the point? What's the point of being so aggressive on everything you do for the gym and you get protein shakes and you get this and you buy shorts off Amazon and you go to Lululemon and you do this and you do that? What's the point? What's the point if we're investing so much in the way we look and not enough in the way our spirits are? When is the last time we invested in our spirits? When is the last time we invested into the way our spirits are being guided? Why is this so important? Because in a time like today, it is so easy for each of us to think with our physical minds instead of with our spiritual, our spiritual selves. And then we wonder why we get into discussions on Twitter. And then we wonder why people are saying this and that, and we fall into the trap as if we're thinking with that kind of worldly logic. Does that make sense? Our spirits have gotten weaker. Or rather, our spirits have gotten political. If you're discussing politics more than you're discussing the transformation Jesus did in your soul, there's a problem. Amen? Stay with me. It's only going to get better. Stay with me. There are things that will affect us in a spiritual sense that will never come near us in the physical sense. Somebody punching you in the face in the physical will directly affect you. But somebody saying a negative comment about a president you've never met should not affect you the way, it's, the way it has been. Amen? Amen? Physically, you feel like they are, well, physically, they aren't doing anything. But spiritually, internally, you feel like they're punching you in the face. Why? When spiritually, on your guard, knowing or maybe just coming back from an encounter or just coming back from praying all week, that would never affect you. Amen? We starve ourselves spiritually, and we wonder why sometimes the things our mom says or the things your coworker says, why it gets on our nerves the way it does. It's because we're not functioning with our spirit. We're functioning in our brain. We're functioning with our heart. And read everything it says in that book about your heart. It says that your heart is fickle, that it can't decide. In fact, it says your heart is deceitful. So all this, this entire generation, every channel, every TLC thing, every this, uh, I'm about to hear with cable, by the way, because every channel says all these young people decided to go with what they felt. Go with what they felt. With a deceitful heart? Do you understand that what you feel might change tomorrow? But the Bible says that our spirits are forever. Why aren't we thinking with our spirits? Why isn't TLC talking about, oh, what they feel in their spirits, that's what they affected? No, they will never say that because everything is about how we feel today. Everything is about how will this affect you? How will that affect you? What do you think of this tweet? Even social media is designed. The question that they came up with, they did years of research at Facebook just to come up with a prompt that will make us so, so engaged with the, with the social media platform itself that we would write out a status. That question was, after years of research, what's on your mind? You've seen it, right? The minute you log on to Facebook, it's asking you what you think. Little did we know, and little do we know, that God has been asking us the exact same thing. But we'd rather tell Facebook than talk to him. I'm done here, bro. 
If you're taking notes, I highly suggest you write number one with a red circle and you put train yourself. Because that's what Paul is telling Timothy. It's time to train yourself. Now, Paul knows Timothy. Stay with me. Paul knows Timothy. So he knows that he, tell, he has to clarify to him. You, we can assume that one, Timothy is a young guy, and two, he was a guy who cared about the way he looks. He cared about the way he felt. Why? Because Paul has to clarify. He has to tell him, do not train your body. I know you, bro. I know that when I tell you train yourself, you're going to go straight to the gym and go, bro, I got to look super sane. <laughs> Paul was telling him, this is not what I mean. I need you to train yourself in godliness. I need you to feed your spirit, not your muscles. Amen? Amen. All the gym guys are like, that feed your muscles. That's not how it works. <laughs> Stay with me. I need you to feed your spirit, not the way you look. Because sometimes the way you look, when you look in the mirror, you might not be exactly happy with the way you look. But how many times are we looking at ourselves in the mirror with our spirits? You would see that God designed somebody that he says is wonderfully made. Amen? Amen? Come on. Give, give God an applause just for that verse alone. Just because he wrote that in the Psalms. Amen. We have to train ourselves. We have to train ourselves. This is not a joke. If you plan on being an essential leader for a time such as this, you have to train yourself. And not in the, as a physical, like it says. We have to find ways to train ourselves in godliness. Why? What is so important about being godly in a time like today? What is so important about saying no to certain, certain um, physical things that we do to try and get better? What is so important about that? I think that if we were more swayed by our spirits and less by our flesh, we would have more conversations with God, uh, with people, than more conversations about politics with people. Can you see how, and I feel like this is the most relevant election year of all time. But even four years ago, we weren't talking about things the way we do today. It has become so polarized. It has become so black and white. It has become so, are you with me or are you against me? And that's not the way the Bible says. That's not what Jesus says should be in ministry. There were people opposed to Jesus, yes. There were people walking with Jesus who at one point wanted to kill him. So Jesus isn't saying that there will never be opposition. He was just telling us there, there will be opposition, but it's a problem if there's a ministry versus ministry opposition. Do You see, because he really wanted us to understand Churches don't fight against each other. And from what I've been seeing, we've been taking our quote-unquote identity politics to such a point that churches have been clashing. And members from this church and members from that church and members from every church have been kind of going at it as if it's about the kingdom we're establishing on earth. But can I tell you and can you tell the person next to you, it's not about this kingdom. Tell them louder. Wake them up. It's not about this kingdom. Amen. Tell them to stay with me. I know it's kind of cold in here, but stay with me. It's not about this kingdom. The Bible says that John and James, two of Jesus' disciples, were with him one time. And they were walking with Jesus. So they knew the Bible because they knew who Christ was. And that they found that another guy around the corner was preaching the gospel. So they went over there and they silenced him. How? We don't know. Hopefully they didn't kill him. <laughs> they silenced that guy. And they came back to Jesus and told him, Jesus, you're not going to believe it. We found a guy preaching the gospel you told us. But we shut him up. Jesus was like, <laughs> he was like, for a lack of a better word, you idiots. <laughs> the following verse has been taken really out of context. But he told them, 
If they're not against us, they're for us. Now, a lot of people have taken that to mean we can disagree with, with each other when it comes to churches and principles. And yes, we can. But let's not disagree with each other that we are both churches being used as vessels to bring the gospel forward. Amen? It's the minute we get in between that that we begin to blur the lines between what Jesus says and what we want to do. Amen? Which is why Bishop has gone crazy on this stage telling us, this is a little bit of a red flag. Please watch out for this. The enemy is going to lead us to start thinking this. And we see those things. First of all, Bishop is probably one of the wisest guys I know. He's not going to get up here. Amen. 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 He's not going to get up here and waste our time. Amen. So a lot of people, and you can see it on social media. You could literally find this. A lot of people have been coming forward left and right, left and right. Bishop Brutigasia this. Bishop Brutigasia that. Us doing the, 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 the Jesus, what, what was it called? Um, come on now. You know that guy was here. <laughs> Evangelicals for Trump, which really, really, and even backstage and even on the stage, you can see it, the event was called Faith in America. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So all of a sudden, people start saying this, nah, nah. We're, say, we're, we're, we're aligning ourselves with a certain candidate. No, no, no. It's not, it's not about the person. It's about the kingdom. Amen? Amen? Let's just make that clear. Let's just make that clear. We do not endorse everything the president says. Does that make sense? Yeah. We can't have disagreements between what he says and what he has done and what he is trying to do. But for whatever reason, there was a, there was a huge lack of distinction there. And if we were able to throw an event like that, and first of all, for those of you guys who were here, you were witnesses to everything we did. No, we didn't sacrifice anybody. <laughs> All we did for three hours was literally what? Say it louder for the people in the back. All we did for three hours was pray. I don't know about you, but I would much rather be on any side that is pro-prayer than anything else. Amen? Amen? Let's, just take, let's just make that loud and clear. Let's just make that loud and clear because just because... Of a, of a certain leaning towards a certain candidate, it's impossible for us to align ourselves wholeheartedly with what he's doing. Why? Because we don't count on man. I feel like I got to say that louder. Why? Because we don't count on man. We don't count on a human person. We do not believe in a specific man or a specific woman to take us into the next level of spirituality. That's impossible. We don't put all of our eggs in that basket. We'd rather put all of our eggs in the kingdom. We'd rather say, Jesus, it's what you want to do on this earth. So per usual, I've been getting the kind of questions of, oh, but what about this? And what about the election? Honestly, honestly, uh, don't ask me. I'm a youth pastor. I'm not a political commentator. I have not been trained in the ways of, of laws and elections of this and that. However, I will pray for justice. I will pray that things come out to the light. I will pray that if there is anything shady going on, that we find out about it. Not we as the church, like, oh, it is. We don't, we don't care, bro. Relax. But that people, citizens of this country, can find out. Why is this so important? Because if they can rig, quote, unquote, this election, they can rig any election. And that should alarm all of us, red or blue or green or whatever you believe. That should alarm you. Amen? Last time we were on this stage, we talked about how Illuminati is controlling stuff. First of all, we discredited that. If you weren't here, you can check us out on YouTube. The message is there. We discredited that. We don't put our eggs and we don't put our beliefs in how strong a group of men and women are. We believe in Jesus. And he can dismantle any Illuminati, any plan, anything from the enemy. He can take it apart. The Bible is specific, and it says, no weapon formed against us shall, come on now, prosper. Amen? I don't know how we got into that, but uh, point number one was train yourself. Amen? Amen. Train yourself. Can you tell the person next to you, train yourself? Train yourself. Now, I really want to jump into this next part, and we're almost done. There's, uh, there's only, there's only uh, 
eight more points. I'm just kidding. There's only two more points after this. If you know me, you know I keep it to three only, only. I need you guys to go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to keep jumping into this. 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 12 to 16. And, um, and it says as follows, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Now, until I get back, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And if you guys can put up the verse in the background. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. We get that. Now, it says, meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Let's put a pin on that part right there. Paul isn't just telling us, look, this is what I want you to do and this is what I want you to believe. He's giving us six things or six key things that we should be focusing on. He says as follows, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. In word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Until I come back, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Now, why is this so important? Because if you're taking down notes, the following verse is what I want you to write down. Meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them. Point number two is so that your progress may be evident to all. So that your progress may be evident to all. I'm kind of waiting for the... So that your prog... Okay. So that your... So... All right, I'll just read it off my thing. So that your progress may be evident to all. Now, the reason why this is so important. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I gave you guys these slides. The reason why this is so important is because he's highlighting something specific about us. And he's saying, command and teach these things, but let no one despise you for your youth. In fact... I want you guys to be examples in speech, and this is the ESV translation. So we're missing the word, which is why it's so important to read different translations of the Bible. In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. If we're going to get to a point where we are going to train ourselves, spiritually speaking, we have to begin to understand what we're going to train ourselves on. Now... Has anybody ever heard of, of um, like, A to B planning, which is step-by-step planning? What I love about that is, one, it's for planners. It's for people who really plan out their days, and it's, like, step-by-step-by-step. By step by step. From 9 to 6, from 9 uh, to 9.05, I drink my coffee. From 9.05 to 9.15, how many actual planners do we have in this room? I will keep my hand down. One, two. Uh, I don't see your hands if you're back there. I, I saw your kind of half a tenth. All right, love it. That planning is really meticulous and really not for me. I like what they call um, A to C planning. And that's really what I want you guys to focus on tonight. Because let's assume, for example, and what I tell the guys every Monday is, let's assume that spiritually we're on ground zero. Let's assume that we have no spiritual life whatsoever. Assume that you haven't prayed since the beginning of COVID. Let's assume that, for example, you haven't allowed yourself to grow spiritually at all this year. Let's assume that every single day you've been more on social media than you have been on your Bible. Just for a second. You would start off at what's known as A, letter A. The point isn't to get to A to Z, it's just to grow. You would start off at an A, but you want to be at C. Let's say C is the pulpit. You want to be at C. C is you very, very spiritually well-trained. C is you knowing exactly what God wants you to do, even if we don't know how to do it, but knowing that God has a plan for you, and that's something that you try to live out every single day. C is you praying at least a few times a week. C is you studying your Bible various times, whenever you can. Let's pretend that that's C. 
What is our B, you might be wondering. To be honest, the B is the how. How are you planning on doing that? Because you can plan all you want to improve. There's no point unless you're going to start. And you have to start somewhere. Are you with me? Paul is so specific in what he tells Timothy that it's, it's really mind-blowing. Because he's providing the knowledge from an older guy who's about to retire from his ministry. He's providing that knowledge to a younger guy who's about to begin his ministry. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is him just starting out. He just got his fourth letter in the mail. And he's wondering, what does Paul have to say to me now? And he tells them, I want you to focus on the following things. One, I want you to focus on improving yourself. And not just that, I want, to, I want you to visualize that you are an already better person. What is the B? What is the how? We start spiritually improving our lives when we, when we focus on the following things. When we focus on prioritizing our word, our conduct, our love, our spirit, our faith, and our purity. How do you train yourself in godliness? You watch out for the things that you say. That's your word. How do you train yourself in godliness? You watch out for the way that you behave. That's your conduct. How do you train yourself in godliness? You love on people, even if they don't love you back. You help other people. You help open doors for other people even if they end up turning your back on you. Amen? How do you improve in your spiritual life? By focusing on your spirit, on your faith, on your purity. Now, we're not going to hand out rings in this service and start telling you to be pure until a certain time in your life. We're not really going to do that tonight. But we do have to spiritualize our purity. We have to prioritize what it is that we do and when we do it. Amen? If there's anybody in this room who at some point or another feels like they slipped up, like your purity is probably on the ground and ground zero, that's okay. But use tonight as a platform to get to your C. Use tonight as an opportunity to get closer in touch with God, closer in touch with your faith, with your spirit, with your purity with what God is trying to do by way of your words, by way of your conduct. How do we improve and how do we become, like the Bible says, to be examples in speech and conduct? What do we do? What, what happens? Why does he say this to us? Why, does he, why doesn't he say, hey, let no one, um, let no one let, annoy you about your youth? Let no one bother you about your youth. Verse 12, why does he say let no one despise you for your youth? Because the youth will do the opposite of all six of these things. And that's not a good look to the world. People hate the youth sometimes. Why? Because we're good at being destructive. We're good at being impure. We're good at being unspiritual. It's not about the youth. He's not telling him, hey, let no one hate you because you're 20 years old. Let no one hate you for the fact that you're 15 years old. He's telling you, worry about the youth of your spirit. It was never about age. It's not about how old you are. It's about what you do with the spirit that you have. Are you with me so far? You guys with me so far? Because God is being so serious when he's telling us, I need you to not be hated while you are spiritually young. I want you to be an example. What, an example in what, God? An example on these six things. Amen? If we're going to do any kind of impact in this world, if, we're, if you're planning on doing anything in this life with God in your context, you have to train yourself spiritually. And you have to be an example on these six things. Let no one despise you for the fact that you serve God. Let no one hate you for the way that you behave in public and in private. Let no one come between you and the plans that God has given you because they see the way you behave on social media. Amen? There is nothing on here about arguing with people online about politics. 
There is nothing on here about choosing a president. There is nothing on here. So why do we prioritize these things? Why do we feel like this election is going to affect us in a, in a really, really different radical way? Why? Because of immigration status? Do we know that that's not going to change overnight? That's going to be a process regardless. Why put our hope in a man for our immigration status? Why not put your hope in Jesus, who in 10 years can do what no man can do, and in 10 seconds can do what only he can do? There is nothing stopping you from believing more yesterday than today. Nothing. There is nothing stopping you from behaving better spiritually. There is nothing stopping you from leaving this church saying, I don't have to wait to C. I'm already at E. I'm already at F. I'm already at the best part of the alphabet. Does that make sense to you tonight? There is nothing stopping you from walking out of this place knowing that you are better than the way you walked in. But like we say in SYA, God will only use what you give him. You can give him 5% and he'll only use what? You give him 10%, he'll only use what? But if you give him 100%, what will he use? Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but this message is exactly what we need for a time such as this. This message is something that if you don't put into practice today, I need you to know that this needs to be an alarm in your head. This needs to come with warning signs. Why? Because a message like this is one that you can either begin to practice or you will see the fallout and the result of it because you don't practice it. Amen? I'm not here to scare you. I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to let you know that the life you live is only just one life to live. One. Everybody gets one. You guys know that reference? Family guy? Everybody gets one. You only get one. So what is our third point? It goes as follows. If you're taking down any notes, it says, meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them so that your progress may be evident to all. That's point number two. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. I love this translation because it says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. I'll finish this one. It says, take heed to yourself and your doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing so, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Persist in this, and I hope you guys can see it. I hope you guys stay with me. I asked them to move this, but maybe it's not enough. Just so you guys could see that verse. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and what? You guys can't read it. Can you guys see it? You will save both yourself and what? Your? I'm oh, sorry, I can't hear you guys. It's like... There's only a few people hearing tonight, and I need you guys to really yell it out. You will save both yourself and what? Why is this so important? Why is Paul breaking this verse down? Why did he start off talking about us and the things we got to work on? First of all, Paul, why are you talking about other people? Why are you highlighting things about other people? Why are you saying to keep a close watch on ourselves and on our teaching? And that by persisting and by doing this, we will save both ourselves and our hearers. You want to know why? It's because the minute we don't persist and the minute we don't watch our teaching, we'll do the six opposite things of this. And the problem with that is that he's trying to save us. And he's telling us, if you don't do those six things, most likely you will destroy yourself. Most likely, spiritually speaking, you will destroy yourself. Now, I didn't really expect an applause or an amen in that part, but I do know somebody's really trying to make it happen. I love you. I love your heart. Thank you for trying. But the point is a lot more important. The minute we do the opposite of those six things, we will technically be destroying ourselves. How do we know that? Because we, if we persist in this, we will save both ourselves and our hearers. Where is that coming from? Why is Paul all of a sudden talking about our hearers? What I love about these six points is really the following. Nobody cares about how you talk about in private. 
But everybody cares about how you conduct yourself in public. You with me? Stay with me, guys. We're almost done. You can love in public and in private. We get it. You can have faith in public and in private. We, lo- we know that. We love that. But you can't necessarily be pure all by yourself all the time. Does that make sense? Because when you're unpure, you're technically bringing down somebody with you. Amen? You guys with me? By doing so, you save yourself and your hearers. How did that happen? How did that happen? This is how. Because if you practice these things and immerse yourself in them, so that people may see your what? Progress. So you go to the gym for what? So people can see your... But when you practice your spirit, you do the same thing. So people can see your... It's all about... It's all about... So that means from tonight, you have an A, but really what it matters is, you're with me, so that eventually you can get to your C. (laughs) So eventually you can get to your C. But along the way, and I love this, Paul is guaranteeing that along the way, people will be watching. Somebody's watching. Somebody's always watching. You might think you're doing it in private. You might think that it just disappears on Snapchat, but somebody's always watching. You with me? I want you guys to stand to your feet. Have just a few minutes, and then I heard that Wolf is here. He's trying to perform. He's trying to get me off stage. I'm just kidding. I want you guys to stay with me. Now, the important thing about this passage The important thing about this passage is really that last verse. You will save yourself and your hearers. How many of you guys have ever been traveling? You've been in an airplane. You've been in an airplane. You notice that on the signs, you notice that on the paper things where they draw the little people that are scared. (laughs) And uh, the plane's on fire and, like, the person's, like, not screaming. They're, like, straight-faced. Um... It usually says, or it's told to you, that if there's a pressure change within the cabin, some masks are going to fall from the top. And what do they say? One, yes, put it on yourself. That's important. But if you have any kids, who, you, who do you put it on first? Yourself. This passage has the same exact principle. In order for you to save those that come after you, or those younger than you, you have to make sure that you yourself are saved. I'm gonna say it one more time. In order for you to save those around you and those younger than you, you have to make sure that you are saved first. Amen? Amen? So by doing, I love the one clap, love it. (laughs) No, it's okay. I I love the heart it takes to do one clap. That takes a lot. For you to commit to just the one. That's, I love that. Passionate about that. Stay with me. Now, why is this so important? Because we have to do the same exact thing those cabin pressure people do. You have to make sure that in order for you to be able to take care of everybody else, that you are well taken care of. Amen? This does not just apply to leaders. This does not apply to people within pastor's circle or within, oh, this doesn't apply to me. I've been here for over 15 years or 20 years or 30 years. That's okay. There have been people that have been sitting here in this church from the day this got started. And what amazes me about them is they don't have an ego about it. This is so important because it's important that you save yourself before you try to save other people. You have to make sure you're good before you tell anybody else that they're not good. In the world today, it's the complete opposite. It's okay, you guys can come out. In the world today, it's the complete opposite. And people who are not good are telling you that you are not good. Amen? Somebody told me today something that is probably the most relevant thing I've heard in a long time. 
And it's that misery loves company. Misery loves company. People who are hurt, people who are offended, people who are, they feel disrespected at a certain time, at a certain point. They love making sure other people are joining in there with them. They love making sure that if they are offended or they are hurt, that you know about it. They're not going to go to the person who hurt them. They're not going to go to the people that hurt them. They're going to tell you about it. A random person who really can't help other people. And that's what's so important about this message. If you take anything I'm saying seriously, I need you to believe in this following part. You need to focus on yourself more than you focus on other people. It's only by doing that that you will be granted the audience that this passage is talking about. Why doesn't your group change? Why have you found that nobody's showing up to your group? Probably because you're not being an example. You're not being very follow-worthy. Amen? Why haven't things or circumstances gone a certain way in your life? Probably because you've been doing the same exact thing since COVID started. Probably because your relationship with God has been non-existent since this pandemic started. Amen? I'm not out here to attack anybody. I'm, frankly, I'm talking a lot, uh, speaking a lot of this for myself. Because nobody's exempt from being helped in this life, including myself. I've had a lot of conversations with people lately who say, oh, but that's different because you're the quote-unquote pastor. First of all, we really hold titles to a really hard regard these days. A title means nothing. It means nothing, guys. It literally means nothing. God is not going to say, Pastor Rico of SYA, he's not, he, he doesn't care, dude. He's going to call me by my government name. Gonna be, he's going to call me by, by my full name, which apparently my mom thought I was going to be a novella artist because my middle name is Savage, Savagely Spanish, and I'm not going to tell you about it so you can starve. No. In any case, in any case, stay with me. We're almost done. I want to make two prayers tonight, just two. Two prayers. One prayer is for people who align themselves with this message. You see yourself and you say, you know what? I'm not behaving in the best way I can. My speech is literally nonsense. My conduct, please don't tell my mom. My love, what love? My faith, non-existent. My purity, gone. The minute I have a Wi-Fi connection. Stay with me, it's okay. If you align yourself with this message, then that first prayer is going to be for you. The second prayer is for people who, maybe you came to this church and you don't really know anything about Jesus. We've been talking about Jesus all night. Truthfully, that's who Paul's talking about in the Bible. Why? Because we believe that book right there. And that book says that if you give your heart to Jesus, that he will accept you for the way you are. That doesn't mean he'll leave you the way you are. No, expect some kind of transformation. But expect that transformation to be for the better. Amen? Expect it to be for the better. God knows who he made, and he knows what he thought when he made you. And believe me when I tell you, you have been made for a plan. And more than that, you have been made for a purpose. And a lot of us live our lives assuming that we can figure it out, or college will tell us, or our counselors will tell us, or our parents will tell us. But nobody can tell you your purpose besides your maker. Amen? When a car is broken, you take it to a mechanic. When your tooth hurts, you go to a dentist. When your spirit is shattered and broken, and you feel like you need more purpose, more guidance, more anything, you go to the one who made you. You with me? Let's give God a round of applause real quick. Before we pray, amen. Before we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to switch the order of the prayers, and I want to pray for those who want to know Jesus first. I want you guys to close your eyes and bow your head. And if you have never made this prayer, or you're making this prayer for the first time, I want you guys to know this, that the Bible is very clear in what it says. It says that Jesus knocks on the door of our hearts, and that he's waiting patiently 
patiently waiting so that you would open the door so that one day when you decide to, he will come in and he will dine with you. He will have literally dinner with you. Why does the Bible say this? Because he's not establishing a one-time connection. He's establishing a relationship. This is not something that will go away tomorrow. This is something that if you believe wholeheartedly tonight, your entire life can be changed. How do I know that? Because my entire life was changed. And a lot of other people's lives were changed the minute they decided to surrender and give it all to Jesus. So I want you guys to repeat this prayer after me. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you guys to shout it as loud as you can. Don't worry about the person next to you. Don't worry about the person who brought you. I want you to say, Lord, I believe in your promise, in your plan for my life. Take my life, transform me, and enter my heart. Write my name, my full name, my government name in the book of life and do something in my life that no one, no one could ever do. It's in your name that I pray. And we say amen, amen, and amen.